Dr. Lindau, you are the director of the program in Integrative Sexual Medicine, which is a clinic located at the University of Chicago. Tell us about the focus of your work. Well, the focus of my work is specifically addressing sexuality issues in women and girls who've had cancer. We also see some women whose partners have had cancer and who are experiencing sexual difficulties as a result of that. And some of our patients are patients without cancer but who have complex medical illnesses of other kinds. What are the kinds of sexual issues, uh, dysfunctional issues, whatever they may be, that most commonly present for women in, in of all ages after cancer? Women with cancer commonly present with pain associated with intercourse. So that pain can be prohibitive, such that a woman's no longer having intercourse. Many women have intercourse despite the pain, and that can affect their sense of satisfaction with sexuality, their libido. You know, there's a kind of a cascade of problems that come with pain. Sometimes the underlying problem that causes pain is vaginal dryness, very commonly in fact. And the vaginal dryness is a consequence of loss of the normal circulating hormones, especially estrogen, which keep the vagina moist and well lubricated. If a woman cannot take uh, estrogen supplementation, what about the use of topical, you know, isolated to, you know, just the vaginal area? There are a number of products that have been marketed over the counter for women to use to address vaginal dryness. There are two main classes of these products, moisturizers and lubricants. So I want to first tell you about moisturizers. Moisturizers are products that are meant to be used every couple of days on a maintenance basis. Moisturizers are not a very effective product to use at the time of intercourse. That's when we want to use lubricants. So a woman who has really troublesome vaginal dryness, we might try moisturizer every couple of days as a maintenance therapy, and then recommend when she's having sexual intercourse that she try any one of a variety of lubricant products. And there are several classes of lubricants that can be used. What about if a woman wanted to use the estrogen ring or estrogen uh, supplementation that's topical that isn't absorbed systemically? You know, there is topical there, cream that contains estrogen or that can be compounded to contain estrogen that can be used on the vulva, on the outside of the vagina. And that itself alone can be quite effective. We don't have good studies to know how much of that estrogen is absorbed into the bloodstream and therefore systemically, but we would expect that it would be much less than if a woman were to take an oral pill or even use a product inside the vagina. The products that can be used inside the vagina include a ring that you know, releases small amounts of estrogen and a tablet and cream that can be used inside the vagina. And I think one of the you know, confusing issues that we haven't sorted out well yet is separating the vagina from the vulva as two different organs and knowing when we could get away with just a little bit of vulvar estrogen and then moisturizers and lubricants for the vagina and when a woman really needs that additional estrogen inside the vagina. We need to understand this better. What about the use of testosterone and even the idea that a woman, especially before she has her surgery, gets a baseline to know where is her estrogen and her testosterone, basically a hormonal panel mm -hmm. prior to surgery, mm -hmm. so physicians know, all right, when they repeat the blood test, they, they have a point of reference to figure out what they can do to balance this person out a bit. No, I think this is a very interesting idea that we might assess a woman's sex hormone status and physiology before she undergoes any treatment at all for her cancer, if for no reason other than to give her that information. Because patients it's really, it's very empowering, and patients really wonder, is it in my head or is it something physiological? And just knowing can be therapeutic. One of the challenges in women is that measuring testosterone is tricky. The testosterone tests that many labs use are meant for men, where the testosterone levels are several fold higher. And so we need to make sure that we're using appropriately sensitive tests for testosterone to even get a reliable level. And so while a woman pretty much, we all know what some of the side effects are when you have low estrogen, mm -hmm. what would be some of the side effects or, not, or the symptoms mm -hmm. that a woman might experience if she has really low testosterone? 
you know, we have seen in women who've had their ovaries removed. Now, the ovaries are a very important source of testosterone or androgen in women. So women who are menopausal by virtue of having their ovaries removed do show signs of low libido that seems to be associated with that abrupt loss of testosterone. And in fact, it's in that population of women where testosterone and maybe even drugs like you know, sildenafil or the drugs that are being used to treat men for erectile dysfunction might have their most effect in, in that population of women. So, you know, while uh, I, I would, I hesitate to ever say there's a solution out there that we should never use for anyone, I think that we need a better understanding about the risk benefit profile of testosterone for women with and without cancer to treat libido issues. Dr. Lindell, the woman who's about to go in for prophylactic intervention, let's say, to have her ovaries removed, right. she's BRCA positive. Mm -hmm. And the real fear of, especially if they're on the younger side, I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to have my ovaries and I'm not going to have a libido. And I'm. A lot of these women are fortunate. They are given supplementation. They're not at risk. And, you know, many times they wake up and there's a patch on their rear. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about some of the intervention and the concern that we deal with with women who do not have cancer but are going in in an effort to prevent a cancer, right, right. but there's a byproduct to that. Well, this is such an important question because now that we have enough knowledge about genetics and we'll continue to get more and more, we're able to offer women an option to reduce their risk for developing cancer once we've detected a genetic risk. Sometimes that can be a between a rock and a hard place problem, right? So the two options are do nothing and be at high risk for developing cancer and do something which involves essentially castration, you know, removal of the ovaries, removal of the breasts potentially. And these can be real, this is not a great choice for women who find out that they are at elevated risk. Sexual concerns are a major reason why women choose not to go forward with therapies that can be used to reduce their risk for cancer, even once they've been diagnosed with a, with a genetic risk. In this population of women, it seems plausible that some degree of estrogen therapy and perhaps some degree of testosterone therapy might be beneficial. The question is, how do those benefits balance out against the risks? And what's so frustrating is we don't yet have the information we need to fully counsel women about that. So as you speak to this, my, uh, I guess my closing thought with you would be that prior to starting treatment, prior to having surgical intervention for even prophylactic reasons, there needs to be, I believe, a discussion between patient and doctor about issues of sexuality. And for the patient with cancer, the medical oncologist before treatment starts, this should be part of the dialogue. It is 100% true that physicians must talk with women who are undergoing treatment for cancer. Most of the time, it's breast cancer or gynecologic cancer or another cancer type that's affecting her sexual organs directly. It's essential that we talk to women about the sexual implications of their cancer. Which means we have to get doctors comfortable. We do. Especially male doctors. It does seem from the literature that female doctors are more likely to broach this issue than male doctors. One of the challenges is, you know, to give male doctors some credit, we don't have the same array of options for treating women with sexual problems as we do for men. So when we have more treatment options, my hope is that male and female doctors will do a better job at talking about these issues with patients. Until then, we cannot be silent because the consequences of not addressing this issue are really lifelong. It's just not acceptable. Obviously, we could go on a very long time, and I wish we had more time, so we're going to have to make more time in the future. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you for what you do.